Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next Thursday. Time to go to the beach. Hey everyone, and my- 11 of Death Space Filling the Void. Now that this podcast has gone more than 10 episodes, I was reflecting a little how my mindset has changed. I've learned. My perspective on death does feel different. I started this podcast to help create a space for people to learn a little bit about death and, and how to talk about it and what other people are going through. Because, because I felt a little bit, because I felt a little And it's been really helpful for me, and I hope for you as well. This week, Jamie and I are up in New York visiting some family and friends, which is so exciting to do. Got a little beach weekend planned as well. Life's a little... <laughs> but I've got another wonderful interview lined up for today's episode. It's with Sarah Ezrin. Sarah is a writer and a yoga teacher or instructor. I'm not sure if it's... I'm, I'm still new to yoga. <laughs> I reached out to Sarah after an article that she wrote about yoga for grief. It was about how certain poses can be helpful, can help you process. And, and I'm still new to yoga, but it, it is. And it does help you connect your body with... And so we had a, a very open conversation about the losses in Sarah's life. She was incredibly open. And that's to do. But Sarah also talks about yoga, grieving. And grief is such a big part of this podcast and learning how to manage it. So I hope and you enjoy the interview and hope that it can provide you if you're, if you're currently grieving. Joining me now is Sarah Ezrin, not, who's a writer not, and yoga teacher a good based th- out of the Bay Area. Sarah, thank you so keep much your for your time. Content. Thank you for having me. Well, I reached out to you after reading uh, an article you had written about grief, yoga, or, or yoga for grief. Why or, or how do you think yoga can be helpful for someone in the in the grieving process? So I, you know, I had a lot of experience with grief, unfortunately or fortunately, because I do think I do think having a lot of loss in your life can make you appreciate life in in a whole new way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the the place that I found the most solace was on my yoga mat. Mm-hmm. And you know, part of that is is not only just moving your body, you know, where which which just feels good in general, but also you know can be settling for the nervous system. But it's also watching the thought processes as as they arise. And when it comes to something like grief, you know, you can really feel either like locked into an emotion. It can feel like an abyss that you see no way out of. And what yoga teaches us is the transient nature of reality, you know, that like things are always changing, even the most uncomfortable and horrific moments in our life. Not only do they change over time, but it is from those that we grow the strongest. Hmm, so is- being able to like see that in your own body. So like, for example, like doing a pose, like a warrior pose, like warrior two, right? Um, you could, which, uh, explain kind yeah, of what a, what a warrior totally. pose yes. <laughs> So like with, with warrior two, so, so there's like a category of postures that you would call like standing poses. Okay. You know, you've got you've, your feet are on the floor. It's something strengthening or opening for the legs. And in warrior two, the front knee is bent, the back leg is, is straight, your arms are out to the side, front, and it's this very powerful, expansive pose. And when it is held for a long time, stuff comes up, <laughs> like a lot of stuff comes up. And you can just watch the quality of, of the mind in those moments, like boredom can arise, discomfort, because it's really strengthening for the front outer hip, so the front outer hip starts to kind of scream at you. Um, you know, the shoulders get tired things start to arise and you're watching your body's responses, but you're also watching your mind's responses in there. And and what you're noticing is, you know, not only are these just thoughts, but this pose is not going to last forever. And you get to, to learn how to both persevere in the moment 
to trust that this pose is strengthening me for a good reason, right? The, the stronger the outer hips, the more supported the lower back is. I mean, never mind just like the symbolism of like learning to stand in the face of something uncomfortable, right? Just like having your feet planted and, and then just, you know, watching the responses within that. And then, and then the pose ends, right? And, and you move on, you move on to the next thing. And, and so, you know, it's, it's this like lifetime experience of both that, you know, uncomfortable things are both important to shape us but also that they, that they change. So to get back to like the point of the question is like, what a lesson to learn when you are in the darkest and most painful moment of your entire life. And, and I say, you know, when I said to you, I have a lot of loss and it's both fortunate and unfortunate is it's the most horrible thing that you feel and experience and go through. But when you let it shape you on the other side, it, it, you know, it's it, the lessons that we can learn from those losses will profoundly shift our life. It's almost as if holding a pose in a very uncomfortable position is sort of a microcosm uh, of grief itself in that it's painful. You don't think it's going to end and then it gives way and, and, and you feel better. You feel better, you get stronger. I mean, I think that like the most, and that's just one way that you can you can work through grief and manifest it in your body. But I think the, the most important part is it's seeing what's on the other side of that perseverance. You're not just holding a pose to have a cuter bum, you know? I mean, like there's like a famous like yoga bum that everybody wants and like, yes, okay, there's like, there's definitely gonna be some physical benefits to how the body looks afterwards, but that's not what the lesson is, right? The lesson is, in the face of that discomfort, surprising yourself with your strength. And then when you come out the other side, being capable of sustaining things that you had no idea that you could sustain. Absolutely. And yeah, so, and, that, and that's just one example and, and one pose. I mean, I think there's other ways too. I mean, the, the article that you're talking about, one of the things that I was really driving home there is that a lot of yoga in a lot of classes, like an everyday class, we focus on like heart opening. And we, we, of course, like who doesn't want that? <laughs> like open your heart and, you know, lead with the heart. And, and so we do a lot of postures where the, the back is arched, what we call like a back bend, spinal extension, and you're trying to open the chest, open the chest. But one of the points that I was making in that, that sequence is that there are times in our life where we actually want to close the heart where it is okay to not be as open. And again, using the physical body, if your heart is broken into a million pieces, when you're in these kind of more rounded, protected shapes. So an example of a pose would be like in a child's pose where you're like on your knees and like folded forward, that that, that can also be a, a place for you to turn in to heal and to come back together again. So there's both this, like, it's the juxtaposition of, you know, that you have these poses that are really like expansive and empowering and strength building and challenging. But then you also have on the other end of the spectrum, these postures that are very quieting and inward and reparative. It's so fascinating to me to think about just simply posing the body and how that affects the mind. There's such a disconnect that I feel like we don't fully understand or, or even appreciate in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, I'd imagine a yoga instructor certainly does, but to the average person, you don't make the connection as much. Yeah, I, I think as a society, we are quite disembodied. We are totally out of our body. We're often in our head. We're not leading from our heart. And, you know, it's like we're up here overthinking or we're like in our devices and, and there is, there's a, there's a disconnect. So it's, it's really special if you have some kind, and it, I don't think it's just yoga specifically, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I teach yoga and that's the modality that I found it, but I think any kind of physical movement, honestly, I mean, even something that wouldn't be categorized as like exercise, let's say like, you know, uh, like my husband is a big gardener, just being outside and being with his hands, he also can become aware of his breath and aware of how he's holding his body. And so I, I think anything that we can do that, that gets a little analog and you can get, you can get your hands dirty and, you know, get close to the floor and just to feel like, how am I holding my body? Because most yeah. of the time,
<laughs> you know, we're like yeah, rounded really forward, which, which yeah. totally. And, and like, you know, this, that's also like a stress response too. That's what the body does when you're challenged is like, that's how you protect your organs. Right. Is, is it's like that, like when a bear comes, you kind of drop and roll. And like, we live like that. We live in this perpetual state of panic be, by way of how we're holding our body and then yeah. just how we're living and thinking. So doing anything that, that there's the expansive thing I talked about with the warrior twos and, and the challenging yourself through strength building. But also if you are going to do something that's more inward, doing it in a way that's, that's a conscious decision to do that and, and kind of over time slowly coming open and, and unfurling again. Oh my gosh, even that movement you just made, <laughs> putting your shoulders back, it, it just completely reframes yourself even momentarily in such a simple way that can, that can go pretty far, I think. A lot of this podcast, I ask people, and, and completely fine if you're not open to it, but I do ask people about their loss and their grief. You mentioned that a few times, if you're comfortable, I'd love to hear your experience and, and, and who these people were and how you started to put one foot in front of the other to move on. I don't think you ever move on. You know, I think, um, mm -hmm. I think you move forward. Definitely. I mean, you, you do move forward, but there is one big takeaway from grief that I've learned over the years is like, it is not linear. It's, I don't even know if it's forward necessarily like in a in that trajectory of forward. I think sometimes you, I think you move, right? So sometimes you move backwards and then sometimes you move up and then sometimes you move down and it's really kind of circuitous. And, you know, some years it feels like a loss that was decade ago happened yesterday. And then Sometimes it, it, it's like you forget. So we, you know, I'll, I'll give a specific example. Is you know, I think the the biggest loss to date was my mom, who I lost when I in my mid twenties, mm -hmm. and she was like my best friend and my everything. You know, my world orbited around her and and her mine, and she was quite ill for for a while. So you know, there was also that side of it too, of like living with a, I lived with her, living with a person with a long-term illness, mm -hmm. a, a stage four lung cancer. But right before she passed, I also lost a brother wow. who had severe mental illness and ended up taking his own life a year and a half before my mom passed away. And then we lost my exactly aunt. We actually lost her right before my mom. And it was just this like, boom, boom, boom. You know, it just, yeah. it was, a really, a very, very dark and difficult time for my family. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, those, you know, and that kind of like epoch, like that period was, I think it, it, it I mean, it completely changed who I am today. It, it is, it shaped me in really beautiful ways. You know, I'm now a mom myself and there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss her. And you know, there's some periods of time where, like I said, like there's like some, some holidays, it's always seems to be around these kind of markers in, in the, the yeah. calendar, like, you know, the holidays or birthdays, it depends on the holiday, but there's some holidays where it feels like I lost her yesterday, you know, like the grief is devastating, even though it's been 11 years, 10 years, 10 and a half years. But then, you know, there's other times where I'm like, her birthday will come up and, and like, I almost missed the date, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But then you also, it's so interesting on those, like, it's like those years where I'm like, oh my gosh, it's October 4th. Like, I can't believe it. it was, it's her birthday. I'm like, oh, that's why I was being irritable. <laughs> like, that's why I was yelling at my husband a little bit more last week. It, I think it comes out in other ways, even if you're not like consciously aware of like, oh, this would have been mom's, you know, 77th birthday or whatever. Totally. I, I totally think. 29th, so. right. 29th. She's, she, where she was always 29th. So 29th birthday. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> You know I what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those were, those were kind of the, you know, that it was the, that succession. I mean, obviously like, you know, little losses along the way of grandparents and great grandparents. And then the next kind of big, big significant losses for me were my dog who was like my daughter. And I, mm -hmm. I 100% believe that our grief for pets is as strong, maybe sometimes stronger 100%. than for the human. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And yeah. she was like literally my child. And then we actually had a miscarriage, my husband and I, before we got pregnant. The first time we, we had a loss. And, and that's what prompted me to actually write that, that article that you found me writing about. But, you know, it's, 
I mean, it's life, right? It's just, it just, I, I, I happen to have a lot of those happening a little bit earlier than I think most, most people, not everybody, obviously there's, there's many people out there with a lot of loss, but yeah, just definitely before my friends, I was one of the first to lose a parent. And yeah, but like I said, like every single one of those experiences has formed who I am and it informs everything I do. Everything how so? I do. How, how so? Yeah, I'm very curious to hear. So how, I you. just have this awareness. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. I mm-hmm. I sometimes like joke like 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 the Wizard of Oz. Like I like I saw behind the veil, and it it's like can be disturbing at times to like always think like oh but this could be the last time. Mm-hmm. This could be the last time, and it can come out in anxiety and fear. And I definitely have a history of anxiety and and that side of things. But every moment I have with my son, like even saying goodbye right now, like just knowing how am I saying goodbye to him when I walk away from him? How present am I with him in in these moments? Because what if this was the last? Mm. And the thing that yoga teaches you is like, it is the last. He may still physically be here, but whoever he was five minutes ago will never be here again. So we must be present in that moment. People are never a finished product. We're constantly evolving. Uh, and that's an important reminder. And it's also, you know, what I, I agree with you where you were saying how it can be a little anxiety inducing. But if you're also living life, loving that hard, treating every moment as if it's the last, I, I just think that's such a beautiful state of being that you're just constantly trying to put love out there and, and realizing that every interaction truly does matter. So that's great. Thank you so much for sh- for sharing all that. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm curious where where you discovered yoga. Was it uh, during this part uh, or period of your life where you were experiencing all this grief, or, or was it something that you had um, gotten into before? No, I, I had already been thankfully. Well, it, that, that was actually I was making a big career transition from working. I was working in the film business and became a yoga teacher like right around when my brother passed. My mom got was at her sickest, and so it was you know that was another kind of those carpe diem moments where like looking down the barrel of my mom's illness. It was kind of the first time in my life that I realized like I have a choice. I don't have to do this job just because I've been doing it or because every other person in my industry is doing the same thing. Mm. So that was definitely, uh, it was permission and, and realizing that like life is short and you have to take advantage of it. Um, but anyway, yeah. To, how many to, people, oh, sorry to cut you off. No, no. Please. How many people that I've spoken to on this podcast have said, you know, I would have never started this or I never would have started yeah. that. Like grief for some reason is pedal to the metal to, I like how you put it. It's permission to take control of your life. It's really, really nice. Unfortunately, it has to come at this dark moment, but uh, it is certainly a light to realize, hey, like this isn't making me happy. Why am I wasting my time on this? The pursuit of something better is is wonderful. So I'm I'm happy to hear that that's the case for you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I wish... I wish it didn't take those kind of, you know, yeah. those, those deep moments, but at the same time, like, that's what I'm, you know, what we were saying is like, I, that, that's one of the, the blessings of them, you know, and, and like, I can tell people that they have choice. I can tell people to listen to their heart and to live life to the fullest, but until the things you love most are threatened to be taken away or are taken away, you don't realize, you know, how fleeting it is. And, and to make that adjustment. So yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm, again, I'm blessed it happened at an early age, but I definitely like need reminders along the way sometimes in the sense of a lot of the behaviors that made me want to leave the, the, the movie industry, my drive to succeed, you know, my working crazy hours, my not having a life or space for a family of my own somehow just got, I was like, oh, I'll become a yoga teacher, you know, and like not realizing like, oh, then you're an entrepreneur and it's like a whole other (laughs) level of stress. And because you love what you do, you work even harder. So it was like, suddenly I was like, oh, I like almost forgot the lessons that I had learned. And so I've had to have these moments of like readjustment, you know, and 
and just starting to kind of figure out like, oh, okay, I, I need to back off of this. I need to make way for this. And like, especially around, you know, having my baby, I still have that deep drive inside of me. But remembering like back to when I made the shift around after mom died, like I left the movie industry because I didn't want to not have a life for the sake of a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So here I am doing the same thing, but, you know, under the guise of yoga, but it's the same, right? Working my tail off for the sake of to, to earn a living. Because you have to, like in yoga, it's, you know, you have to hustle a little harder than uh, in, in salary jobs. But, but also like sacrificing my life for the dollar or for the recognition or, you know, and and it's like, I lose sight of the lessons that I, I learned. And, and so I think, but having had those lessons, when it, these profound things happen, I can kind of come back to it and I can readjust. I can take my foot, you know, we were saying pedal to the metal, but I can take my foot off the gas a little bit as far as career mm -hmm. to like focus much more on my family and home and just kind of making, you know, making those shifts. That's incredible. Uh, how many people struggle with, the ambition they have in their given career while also wanting to make sure they're around their kids or their family, whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. It seems like you are accomplishing, despite with some work, uh, a pretty good balance there. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I think something worth, worth talking about too is like, grief is not just for people that you lose in your life. I am I feel like I'm in a grieving period right now because I'm grieving my old career mm -hmm. and I'm grieving who I was prior to having my baby. And that, even though I, I choose him a thousand times over, mm -hmm. you know, infinity times over, and I, I love who I am as his mom, there is a loss there that's mm -hmm. very real. And I think in the same way that I, I want us to normalize pet grief, you know, as, as in line with, with losing humans, it's, it's, you know, there's also like loss of identity can be just as traumatic for some people, can take just as much time to heal from as losing an actual person. Because you are losing a person, right? You're, you're losing a part of yourself. Totally. Um, so it's, you know, I just want to honor, honor that, that part of the transition is, is really important. Yeah. I'm lucky to still be close with uh, a lot of friends that I've had since childhood. Um, and, you know, as we've gotten older and, and people have started to have children of their own, I've grieved sort of their presence, who we all used to be together, the fun we used yeah. to have, right? We don't get to see each other as much. And so I think more so a few years ago, but still occasionally. I'll grieve being like, oh man, that was so fun. Like, right, like you'll, you'll see a picture yeah. or an email or from back then. And yeah, so I think there are, I completely agree. There are uh, a lot of forms of grief that uh, we have to allow ourselves the credit and, and acknowledge that these are sig not insignificant events for us. Well, as always, thank you and enjoy. Do you know how to say the right thing in a TV show, like a This Is Us? Surprising that that's still on the air, but I'm sure, you know, Meredith Grey is saying the, you know, the right things. It's because someone's writing the words for them <laughs> with the cardist. A card delivers joy and connection, but it's hard to muster. There were parts of this pandemic where even watching The Office wasn't because I was so sad. Introducing a writing specialist for the message inside your what I'm talking about with the TV shows. They're writing it for you. The Cardis Studio creates your message, writes it in the card, tells it for you. All you do is pick the card and tell why you're sending it. No, no errands, no emotional. And you can use the promo code DEATHPOD for 10% off all orders. Today's episode is also brought to you by my software tutor, Relationships. The card is studio. Thank you so much for listening and time to go to the beach.
Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of Death Space Filling the Void. Now that this podcast has gone more than 10, I'm thinking a little bit about how much I've learned. And it feels vastly different. <clears throat> My perspective on death does feel different. I started this podcast to help create a space for people to learn a little bit about death and, and how to talk about it and what other people are because going. I wanted those answers. Because are I Are there actual classes for people in grief? I should probably Google that or like create a workshop <laughs> because <laughs> for some reason, you know, we use the term karma a lot in, in yoga and, and karma, like in the, in the public sense is, is often thought of like, you do something bad and something bad happens to you. But yeah. what karma really is, it's, it's the law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So like, there's just as much good karma as bad karma. And it's like, you, you kind of create these energy banks of like behaviors, right? So like the, the more you do something, the more of that kind of energy you bring into your life. And I feel like for whatever reason, you know, I, mine is like the grief karma. Like it's, it's so funny. Like it's why I get to connect with people like you. I mean, it's amazing who I get to connect with around this and mm -hmm. the, the opportunities and connections that have opened up. So I would love to design something on my own. I mean, I'm sure if people Google it, we do have the sequence. I don't know if you can link to it for them, but, but that would be helpful for people to do on their own. But I, I personally haven't seen classive for it specifically but i know there are workshops moving yeah. through workshops and and this is like putting a little seed in in my uh in my cap too about something maybe to develop down the road but yeah i think any any yoga class is going to be what you want it to be it's whatever you need to work on on that day is going to come up on your mat so you know like it could it's a grief class if you're going through grief and you're moving your body Mm -hmm. It's a joy class if you're in a joyful place. It could be both. These you you feel all these different emotions at the same time. Why do you think that is? I, I've always been curious. I, I, I've spoken with a bunch of people who either teach yoga or practice it, and and they'll describe it in a sense exactly as you are, where these feelings, like people may cry or anxiety, will come out. It's so interesting, the range of experience. Why do you think that is? I mean, I wish I, I wish I was a doctor that I was trained in somatic therapy, which is using your body and movement to heal. But mm -hmm. I am a big believer that, that we do hold trauma in our body. I mean, as we talked about earlier, you know, these positions that we're in when we're under stress, when you start to kind of break away, I think of it like armor, you know, or, or mm -hmm. a shell that's being cracked off of us or removed. I think sense memory, things can kind of come up in, in memory. I think there's a lot of energetic holding. Um, I just think the body is extraordinarily intelligent. And oh, what's that? Well, there's, a, there's an author. It's like the body keeps score. Have you heard of the body keeps score? No. The name is, Do I think it's Dr. Vanderkoek is, is his name, but the body keeps score is he's, it's, it's all about like how trauma lives in our body and big T trauma, like what you would think of, but also like little T traumas, you know, like the honk of a horn is startling for the nervous system. Yeah. And just how these things kind of get, they get, they basically get trapped in our bodies and how we, we can move in order to, to free them. So I think there's that. I uh, like, that's one thing. And again, like, I don't know the science behind that. So don't quote me, look up, you know, the body keeps score <laughs> and, and that'll give you all the answers. But I, I also think there's this idea of when you're going, 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 as we often do, when you are out of your body, as we talked about, because you're in your head or you're on your device, then you come into a yoga class. And either it's quiet or the music is emotive mm -hmm. and you're finally alone with your thoughts and you're finally in this place, a safe place to let go, things are going to come to the surface. It's like if you're constantly running ahead of the experience, then it's going to catch up to you eventually, right? Illness or injury or outburst. Right. Like I was saying, like, like, that's how I always know, like, it's, oh, look at the calendar, you know, is there a death date coming up? Is, is it almost mom's birthday? 
Yeah. But when you, you schedule in these times to be quiet, to be with yourself, to be with your thoughts, then you have the space and you're in a safe place for it to both come up and for you to, to process and look at it if you're willing to. That's so true. This is my experience and, and I've spoken to people who agree with it. I, I'd be interested to hear your take. There are certain times in your life where you're just so stressed and you have so much to take care of that you don't have time to deal with a traumatic aspect of it that until you do. For example, my dog broke his leg in June and it was no. so stressful because we then had to get him out of the park and to a hospital in a car, right? It was just like all these things. And then he was there for a couple of days. So I feel like I was just like setting it aside until we got him back and we could, you know, he was here. Is he okay? Oh yeah, yeah. He's completely fine now. He's got it. Well, he has to go for a second surgery, but poor guy. We're hoping that that will, you know, alleviate the situation. But yeah, after that period, I was my teeth were grit, like my shoulders were up, and then yeah. this cloud of sadness after, like it wasn't getting me during, but after. Yeah, and, and I think that's exactly what you're describing. When you let your, when you're finally open to an. An unraveling that it'll come out for sure. Yeah. 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 So that's very interesting to think of it. You know, obviously the, the moment I was describing was a bit more occasional in that, like that level of stress isn't going to occur for everyone, you know, hopefully that often, but I think what you're describing could be really helpful for day to day stuff. Like someone was rude to you in a meeting or you haven't heard from a friend. They didn't call you, you know, the day to day stress that you can alleviate could come out in a moment like that. Well, I mean, we talk about the nervous system, you know, like when I'm leading teacher trainings and the, the response of the nervous system and stress, there's three res possible responses, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. And that's the way that we respond when we are in danger. So fight, right? Some people get really aggressive and, you know, are ready to kind of spar with whatever the, the experience may be flight that like wanting to shut down kind of run away like you know not wanting to deal avoidant uh and then freeze where you're kind of just frozen in place mm -hmm. and any of those three responses i mean so what we always say like in teacher training for example is when we're teaching those responses is like your body doesn't know the difference between a saber-toothed tiger yeah and the honk of a horn or, you know, I mean, obviously you have a stronger response when something is, is more traumatic. But so for example, I told you, you know, I mentioned that I, I, I have generalized anxiety disorder. I have severe anxiety. So for me, it's like a, a switch is tripped and the slightest thing feels like there's a saber tooth tiger at my door, though it's just my water bottle almost fell. So, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to just feel in our body, you know, how we're, how we're having these responses. And I think what happens, and, and this is, it's, I'm not surprised at all that you were then exhausted on the other side of that, that sadness, that low, because we're in such a heightened state of fight, flight, or freeze, or whatever your response is, but like danger, 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 that in that moment, you're just like getting it done. So it sounds to me, just from what you were telling me is like you guys went into almost like fight mode and in, in a good way of like get it done like get the doggy to the vet figure yep. it out you took action and that's why all the blood goes from our digestive system and our reproductive systems into our limbs is like let's go you know you got it all done and then when you kind of came back to your homeostasis it's exhausting your body is exhausted and you may have been at that level for days. It's not like the nervous system is just like up and down. And I, I think that's also a lot of what we work in, uh, in the practice too, is learning how to settle the nervous system. Like, when are you safe? When do you feel like, okay, I can let go and calm down? And okay, I'm not going to talk politics, but I will say <laughs> that let's talk about the pandemic. Okay. So it's more global. The pandemic, this is, this is, you know, I don't know when we're going to, you're going to air this, but we're, this is 2020. We're dealing with a pandemic. We're on month, you know, nine, we're moving into, everybody's been in a heightened state of, of fight, flight, or freeze. Exactly. You know, you do whatever. Nobody knows what, you know, and, and so 
in, in that uncertainty, it's going to be very interesting when we get to the other side of this, whatever that may look like, of the, the responses of how people's bodies are going to react, what your life is going to look like on the other side. And dare I, I make a bet that like, everybody's going to be very tired. <laughs> There's just going to be this in the collective exhale there's, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I, I think it's not coincidental too, that like, you know, I talk to a lot of people, you know, that the depression levels are extraordinarily high, that people, a lot more people are getting on medication than they used to. Relapse rates are through the roof, you know, and it's like, because everybody's just trying to drop down. So yeah. I know we went on a really long tangent. <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> I that's very a tangent at this, all. But... I think that's very important. <laughs> I have visualized the first time I'm a big New York Rangers fan. I've, I've been looking forward. I love going to a game with my dad, my sister, whomever. And so I've envisioned this like party mode, but I think you're, you're onto something that I haven't realized that like, yeah, I've been at such a high stress level that I kind of, we might not want to do anything right away or, or, you know, obviously the experience may be different for a lot of people, but that is a very interesting thing that I hadn't even allowed to touch what because i'm trying to project like or or find a moment that oh that'll be so fun but i think the first couple weeks after this is all done will be just a breath (laughs) yeah just a big breath and just moving slowly because i think there is going to be a lot of that i think a lot of people are going to be like rushing out there and like ready to go back to life as it was and it's just going to catch up on the other side of that so there there will be that initial kind of adrenaline like wow let's do this, you know, but then it's, it's whether it's everyone's going to get like people will catch colds or something just because the immune system's a little bit, the immune system gets put on hold when we're, our nervous system is, is in that fight, fight or flight, freeze state. I just think we all need to be really delicate with our hearts and just really kind to ourselves in this time. And, you know, if there's days where you don't feel like you can get out of bed and you are not a parent, (laughs) so you can do that, (laughs) get some good Netflix shows on and Google Emily in Paris or something cheesy and fabulous and and just (laughs) honor where you're at on that day and don't push through, don't create more stress just to just to fit some mold of the doing and, and really honoring that this is a big T trauma year. There are a lot of big L losses that people are experiencing, jobs, not to mention family members, you know, right. people and you're in New York, you guys were hit so hard. Yeah. Was, so huge, huge trauma this year, loss and trauma. And we Absolutely. really, really need to honor that. And thankfully, you know, there's practices like yoga where you can hold the space for yourself and, and go through all those emotions in, in the safest and, and best place possible. Yeah, absolutely. Acknowledging the different kinds of grief. I mean, even if you haven't lost someone, the idea of just hearing about the mass sadness of job loss, everything you're describing, an actual family member loss, you can grieve for the world too, you know? So yeah. And little loss, just the loss of routine. That's a loss. My, my husband, he really misses going to the office and, and seeing people and you know for he's a very social guy and and like that's a loss too right mm-hmm. and like the loss of not being able to take my baby to a playground he's never been to a playground you know he's almost one i mean those are little losses too that that we need to honor absolutely i want to go into the sequence that you created yeah tell me how that came to be and and why you think it's effective So that I wrote uh, after my miscarriage and I just was so, you know, people are well-meaning and I, I always appreciate people's intentions, but often they're just the wrong things can be said. People, they try their best, but things can be said that can actually be more triggering uh, than healing. Certainly. And and part of like a, a lot of those things are like when people tell you to like look on the bright side and specifically around miscarriage, for example, people were like, well, you, but you got pregnant. You got pregnant. So oh, like, goodness. why don't you just focus on that? Because, you, you know, obviously you were able to get pregnant and we were, you know, but but it 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 kind of discounts the loss that came prior to that right. or right. something like well then you know when your baby comes 
you'll know that he was who was, you know, we didn't know it was a he at the time, but when your baby comes, you'll know that they are, they're supposed to be your baby. Well, oh. I'm sorry, but so was the one I lost, right? right? Like, and we know it was a girl, like she, she was also my baby. Yeah. So people, and again, this is all very well intentioned, but it, it happened a lot around my mom too. I think, you know, it's just this idea that we're told to buck up and look for the silver lining. And, and, and in yoga, I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of, I see everything is about heart opening, heart opening. And what I realized was I just had this vision of like, all I wanted to do was be curled in to be in this very protective place in my body. And I thought about like my heart being broken into a million pieces and how if I was trying to do all this expansive stuff, heart opening, the shards would almost go everywhere. Instead, it was almost like my body intuitively wanted me to come together so that the pieces of my heart could be put back together oh my gosh that's so sad and wonderful at the same time yeah that's great that was kind of the motivation behind that yeah yeah you know the movie i don't know if you've seen the movie inside out uh the D disney pixar with, with kevin klein oh no inside oh yes yes <laughs> yeah. no, what? i was uh <laughs> I was thinking of like an like, 80s movie. Um, yes, I love Inside Out. With, with yeah. the, it was the about the the little yeah, the, it was about like, the, the, yeah. the different emotions the different are moves. personified. Yeah. And there was that moment where Happy's trying to fix things, right? And a lot of people feel like they have to fix yeah. your grief, whereas sadness just comes over and puts her arm around. I, I believe his name was Bing Bong, and and just acknowledges the the sadness and and sits there with him. And really, you know, when we're trying to fix fix things it, that can't be fixed, when really we just need someone to sit there with us and acknowledge how we feel. Yeah. Well, is there anything- It's hard for people because, well, I, I, sorry, and I know we're running out of time, but I just, I, I think it's worth mentioning as the person holding the space, that's really hard for people. It, it you know, it really takes- some training. It takes being very grounded in your own emotions and where you are and where another person, you know, where you begin and another person ends to really be able to hold that space for them. Because I think what happens is, is that it, it, people end up taking on your loss. It's very uncomfortable for them. They may not have ever processed loss on their own or ever been familiar with it. So it's, it's like my, my, we had a health scare recently with a family member and, you know, one of, a, um, a friend wrote me and she was like, only positive thoughts. And I, you know, I almost want to be like, like, you, you know, like you don't, I've had a sick family member before. Like, no, no, I don't want almost, you know, only positive thoughts. But when my husband's like, well, I don't think there is a right thing to say in that moment. And I'm like, I think there is. And I think what the right thing to say when someone is losing someone or someone is, is, is sick with someone is exactly what you said. It's like putting their arm around you and just saying, I'm so sorry for this experience. I, I imagine this hurts a lot. And that's it. That's all we want in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need you to fix it. I need to simply, you know, have it reflected back that this is painful and, you know, that you're sorry that for what we're going through. And that's it. You, you know, your, your words are not going to fix it. So that's not the goal and that's not what friends and family members, you know, need in that moment. You just simply need somebody to hold the space for you. Absolutely. And I'll share, my mom's okay now, but about 10 years ago, she had breast cancer and that was hard. I was living there at the time. And it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know why specifically. But whenever a friend would do that, would hold the space and say, I'm so sorry that this is happening. It's like the emotions flood out. I, I don't know why that is, but I think that's good. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is because if we stuff them down, like we said, they're going to come out in other ways. And but if we if we let them move through us, if we feel and I think that's kind of like the third thing that, that yoga teaches us. Like we talked about building your strength and learning to persevere. We talked about protecting your heart. But I think the third thing that it does is it teaches us that, that these emotions are moving and transient. Mm -hmm. And so we want them to move through us. You want, I mean, I wrote an article a while ago that, that where I was talking about my grief with my mom. 
And I talked about it like, like almost like the space time continuum gets folded. And like in that release, it's kind of like my grief can sometimes be so strong. It feels like I lost her yesterday, but in a way it feels like I just had her yesterday. Oh, that it's, that's, and that's nice. And it's, 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 it's so uncomfortable and painful in the moment, but it's also like, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. It's like, you just, you can, you're like transported. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh man. Well, this has been a very open, I, 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 I'm blown away by your honesty and your openness. Uh, I really appreciate you chatting with me about all of this. Is there anything you think I'm, I'm missing or anything you think, I'm sure, you know, we could go on for hours, but if there's anything yeah. that's uh, on the top of your mind, I'd love to hear it. Well, first I want to thank you for having me on here and, and even bringing, talking about this subject matter. I mean, we're so afraid of death in the West. You know, we, we have funeral homes where we hide things away and we try to get things done really quickly. And, you know, you don't, it's like when your friend, if someone loses something, you're a friend of yours loses something, you're afraid to even talk about it. And I think if there's any kind of takeaway, it is to get comfortable in the loss, mm -hmm. to remember that grief is not something to be avoided, but it can actually be a blessing in your life because knowing that things are temporary, knowing that everything is fleeting is how we learn to appreciate the moment that we have. Totally. Uh, death is something that will touch us all. And, and that's the point of this podcast is to help us get some tools and, and better understanding to meet that end and watch others meet their end. So where can people find your work if they're looking to connect with you? So everything, I mean, I write for a number of different outlets. So everything's kind of on my website, which is Sarah Ezrin Yoga. But also I love to be connected on social. So if you guys are on Instagram, Sarah Ezrin Yoga. And people can, I'm, you know, in case you can't tell, I'm an open book. Um, so <laughs> if, you, if people have any questions or comments or, you know, anything, I love to hear from people. So please send me messages. And yeah, I'm, I'm always around. Yeah, Especially great. with COVID, I'm always around. <laughs> right. Well, it's yeah. great. I, I like the idea of keeping the conversation going. Definitely. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. And, uh, thank you, Patrick. Talk soon. Because I felt a little bit in the dark. And it's been really helpful. And I hope for you as well. This week, Jamie and I are up visiting some family and friends, which is so exciting to do. Got a little beach well. <laughs> lined up for today's episode. It's with Sarah Ezrin. Sarah is a mother, a writer, and a yoga teacher or instructor. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's... I'm, I'm still new to yoga. <laughs> I reached out to Sarah after reading an article that she wrote about yoga for grief. It was about how certain poses can be can help you process and go through your grief. I'm still new to yoga, but it, it is an incredible how it does help you connect your body with your mind. And so we had a conversation about the losses in, in Sarah's life. And that's, you know, that's not always to do. But Sarah also talks about how yoga can, yoga can be helpful for grieving and, and grieving. And learning how to manage it. So I hope you enjoy the interview and hope that it can provide a little bit for, for you if you're currently grieving. And if you're not, it's certainly a good thing to keep in your back pocket. Well, as always...